name is Aaron Hansen. I'm one of the elders here at Discovery Church. Um, it really is an honor to, to share God's word with you. Uh, my prayer is, is truly that I just basically get out of the way of whatever uh, this message is to be um, and that God wants you to hear. Uh, before I begin, I want to share kind of something that I found humorous over the last, uh, I guess, month or so, uh, and at the same time, very humbling. If you were with us back in the first week of December, I had the opportunity to share a, a message on the first 12 verses of 2 Thessalonians. And uh, I kind of found it interesting how I, I basically took 35 minutes to cover those 12 verses, and actually I probably spent about 12 minutes on those 12 verses uh, and told stories the rest of the time. But nonetheless, Pastor John has basically spent the last four or five weeks and he's only like halfway through. And I just, I, I find it amazing how a, a, a real pastor, because uh, I'm certainly not one of those, uh, can, can take one, maybe two verses and, and really, you know, analyze them and, and dissect it and bring it to life. Uh, and I just feel how, uh, you know, blessed we are to have a pastor that can, can do that. So, uh, he'll be back next week. Um, it, it's just an honor to be up here. Um, it's Valentine's Day, the day of love, so what better day than Valentine's Day to bring you a sermon on lying, <laughs> faking it, pretending that we're something or someone we're not, and if you want a, a, a title for today, it's, it's a cover-up, that's what we're going to study today. Uh, if you would, turn in your Bibles to... Matthew chapter 21. We're going to be looking at just three verses today. Actually, we're going to look at a lot more because I can't fill that much time on three verses. But Matthew chapter 21, as you're turning there, I'm going to give a little backstory uh, so we understand where we're at in the, in the story of Jesus. So in Matthew 21, it starts with Jesus coming to Jerusalem and he's coming as a king. So this is the story where Jesus is coming with his disciples and they're, and they're coming into Jerusalem. And this is where Jesus tells two of his guys, hey, in that village right there, there's going to be a donkey and a colt tied up. I'd like you to go ahead and grab those and, and bring those back because I want to ride in on that donkey. And so the two guys look at him and go, okay, do what you say. Uh, go in it, and just as he described it, there's a donkey and a colt tied up. They bring it back, and Jesus rides into Jerusalem on this donkey. This fulfills the prophecy that is talked about in Zechariah. The next story, I think most of us are familiar with that story, at least we've heard of it. This is where we get the scene where the palm branches are, are laid down on the street. This is where we get the song, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And I think we're familiar with that story. The next story in Matthew 21 is the story where Jesus walks into the temple, and, and after basically seeing that a swap meet had broken out, he gets pretty angry. He throws some tables over, some benches, kicks out the buyers and the sellers, and pretty disgusting. And then we get to this very curious scene that if you have it, Matthew chapter 21, verse 18, if you can, please stand up while we read this. It says, Jesus curses the fig tree. Verse 18, in the morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. And he said to it, May no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. Verse 20 says, When the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did that fig tree wither at once? Thank you. May be seated. So the first question that I had, or the thing that I noticed about this, that's their question, is how did the fig tree wither at once? Again, remember where we're at, we are at in this story. By this time, Jesus has healed the sick multiple times. He's calmed storms. He's walked on water. And he's told a dead guy to quit being dead. So... They're questioning his ability to kill a tree. The second thing that I noticed about this and actually as I was reading the Bible years ago I didn't notice this scene. 
This is one of those, whereas I'm reading for, as Pastor John said, I read for distance, not for depth. Um, I didn't even notice this story. It, it didn't register. I didn't understand the significance. I mean, we have this scene where Jesus and his disciples are walking along the road and Jesus gets hungry. Think of that. Jesus is hungry. And he sees this fig tree in the distance, and he walks up to it, he, he pulls back the leaves, he's going to grab that fig Newton, and there's nothing there. So what does he do? Die, tree! I mean, that seems to me like a little bit of a slight exaggeration, a, a, a slight overreaction. The second thing that I noticed about this story is that I didn't just miss it once. These same events are recalled in, in Mark, in chapter 11 of his book. At the end of verse 12 it says, He, again Jesus, was hungry, and seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. Verse 14 said, and he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. So here again, same series of events noted by two completely different people. What that tells me is that there is something of importance here. There is obviously a lesson that, that is to be learned from this. Clearly Jesus isn't overreacting to the lack of fruit. But what's the big deal? I mean, wouldn't it have been just as easy for Jesus to tell that tree to grow fruit? than to kill it? Clearly, Jesus is teaching us a lesson. He was teaching his disciples a lesson. Jesus has a very good reason for destroying this tree, but I think we need to do a little work uh, first so we can understand this lesson to the fullest. Uh, early on in the Bible, we're introduced, albeit subtly, to the fig tree. Uh, the story really starts at the end of Genesis chapter 2. I like to call this the honeymoon verse. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Amen? No? Okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, this honeymoon lasts all of about 8 seconds as we quickly transition over to Genesis chapter 3. So, for those of you who wanted some sort of Valentine's Day lesson, here, here's your Valentine's Day sermon right here. Men, don't be like Adam. Okay? Before we can grasp the magnitude of about what is to happen, we have to understand that the first two chapters of Genesis are all about, and I'm not going to take that much time to do that, but let's just say that there has been a pattern of goodness that God has created in the first two chapters. So God created the heavens and the earth, and it was good. He created the sun in the sky, and it was good. He created the beasts of the fields and the birds of the air, and it was good. He then created man in his image, and it was very good. So I, I want you to have this visual of a, a perfect place, this perfect peace. So you got it? Okay, get ready to wipe that all away because it takes exactly six verses for man to screw this up. In Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 1, I'm going to be reading from the NIV. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He, the serpent, said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Verse 7, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Alright, we're going to stop there for a moment. What we just read is called the fall. It's when sin first entered the world. So we have this man and woman, Adam and Eve, and they're just hanging out in the garden, chilling, naked, communing with God, and it's all good. Okay. 
And then the serpent appears. And we learn something interesting about the characters of this story. First, the serpent. He is cunning. He is going to try to deceive us. We learn something about Eve. Something very interesting. She's not content with perfection. I mean, think about that. She has everything she could possibly want, but there's only one thing that she can't have. Basically, God gave Adam and Eve one rule. And it wasn't like it was some ambiguous rule like, be good or don't sweat the small stuff. No, this rule was very clear. Don't touch, don't eat. Maybe that's too good. And not only is the rule very clear, but so too is the consequences. Or you will die. So here is Eve, she desires so badly to have the one thing that she cannot have that she is easily deceived. And then there's Adam. This guy's such a mess, we get to learn two things about him. Number one, he is extremely passive. And number two, he's a moron. Well, maybe he's a passive moron, but look at this. We, see, we have this snake messing around with his wife. And in verse 6, Adam is with her. And he just sits back and watches. I mean, this is full-on Homer Simpson stupid. Or for you younger kids, this is Patrick Starr dumb. Okay? Duh. Wonder what'll happen. The, the whole future of the world is at stake here. And this idiot just sits back and watches his wife fall. And then, I don't know if this is worse, but without even asking a question, he joins in in her sin. How many times do we fall into that trap? Our, our wife is struggling with something, and instead of pulling her out or encouraging her through, we join in. Let's keep reading. At the back of half of verse 7, it says, that the eyes of both of them were open." And they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. They sewed fig leaves. So there it is, the fig leaf from the fig tree. And from the beginning, it was known to be used to cover things up. I, I want to keep reading because this is pretty good stuff. We'll get back to the fig tree in a moment. Verse 8 says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He, Adam, answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Verse 12 says, The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Do you see what's happening here? I mean, this is actually quite the comical dialogue. Uh, God approaches Adam, who thinks he can hide. I mean, how ridiculous is that? Here's idiot Adam curled up in a ball, trying to blend in with the bush from, you know, trying to hide from the creator of everything. And, and God calls him out and asks, What happened? And Adam immediately blames who? Eve? Maybe. I certainly wouldn't argue with you if that's your stance, but read verse 12 again. The woman you put here with me. I mean, do you see what he's doing in his, his passive, aggressive way? He's, he's actually blaming God. Yeah, um, I screwed up, so I think I'm going to blame you, God. It's your fault. And then it's almost as if he realizes that that could go badly for him, that he hedges his bet and says, uh, if it's not your fault, then it's definitely her fault, God, because she gave me the fruit. This guy's a joke. I mean, think about this. Just a chapter earlier, just 12 verses earlier, he and his wife were living in perfect peace. And then it's over. 
Uh, anyway, reading about this, uh, Adam, yeah, got me really thinking about the Act Like Men study that a, a few of us are going through right now. Uh, and in this study, one of the chapters we read, it said, Men, be alert. Acting like a man means always being on alert, ever aware, at the ready, constantly, paying close attention, continuously, protecting our homes. Keeping lookout to ensure nothing destructive enters our home like a snake. The, the book goes on to say, the man is to be a source of strength, stability, and leadership. The, the major decisions and responsibilities of your home are on you, men, not your wife. They are your call. Listen to her, learn from her, but don't fail to lead her. Step up and lead. Lead with love and service and tenderness, but act like a man and lead. And look, I'll be the first to admit that I fail at this daily. So what do we do? I think we get on our knees and we beg God to help us daily. Men, we have seen Adam. We have seen this epic fail. Don't be like Adam. So back to Genesis chapter 30, verse 13, God turns to Eve and, of course, she takes a page out of her idiot husband's playbook and blames the serpent. Do you see what's happening here? Nobody is owning the mistake. They almost instinctively blame someone else for their current circumstances. I mean, I feel like I'm reading the story of my kids. Something gets broken. Someone gets hurt, someone's crying, and nobody is stepping up to admit they did anything wrong. Our instincts are to lie. Our instincts are to cover it up. I mean, I didn't have to teach my kids how to lie. They learned that one on their own. And really, that is their, rather, that is our natural tendency. From the beginning, we sowed fig leaves. Okay, so back to the fig tree. That was all free. Uh, Jesus sees this fig tree from a distance. It has these gigantic, gorgeous green leaves covering the entire tree. I mean, this tree is impressive. This tree is impressive from a distance. This tree is impressive from up close. Okay? This tree is strong and healthy. This, this tree is is everything that all the other fig trees want to be. You get it? But then when Jesus goes in to, to grab that, that fig Newton, what happens? It's not there. There's nothing underneath. When those beautiful leaves are pulled back, when, when what's underneath is uncovered, all we have is branches. Sticks. Maybe a worm or two. But nothing good. Nothing that would be expected from a fig tree that has leaves on it. There is no fruit. And, and really it wasn't until I heard a study on these verses and, and really studied the story that I really realized what this fig tree was. Or rather, who this fig tree was. This fig tree is me. I want to be impressive. I want you all to look at me and see a, a strong, healthy, athletic, impressive husband. I want you to look and see a strong, caring, loving, impressive father. I want to be impressive. And then here's the scary part. Any place where I might not actually be strong, or be healthy, be athletic, or loving, or gentle, or caring, any place where I am not impressive, then my instinct is to immediately cover it up. Am I alone on this island? Am I the only fig tree with the, the big, bold leaves 
deeds on the outside, but underneath is some serious sin that has the potential to absolutely destroy me. So what is it? What are you covering up? Are you deleting text messages before you roll into the garage? Are you lying about where you're going or where you've been? Wearing long sleeves to cover up the bruises? Are you deleting the history on your tablet or computer so no one can see what you're looking at? Are you covering up a gambling addiction? A drug addiction? Shopping addiction? Porn addiction? Alcohol addiction? Look, these aren't fun topics to talk about. These are the things that we cover up. Obviously, we're not proud of our, our imperfections in most cases. We're not proud of our sin. I mean, we don't post on Facebook, drunk in the house by myself again. Just got done beating up the wife and kids. Loving me some porn tonight. You're not doing that. This is our sin. We don't broadcast it to the world. We cover it up. We want to be impressive. Rather, we want to appear impressive. So we cover up anything that we don't want somebody to see. But here's the thing. You can't cover it up. It's, it's why in the Bible, after the Bible doesn't end after Genesis chapter 3. It's why God didn't say to Adam and Eve, Boy, oh, you really messed up, but luckily you sowed fig leaves, so it's all good. It doesn't work that way. You can't cover it up. You have to get it washed clean. And there's only one thing that can cover up the mess you and I are making. There's only one thing that can cover you and your nastiness. And it's the cross of Christ. It's the blood of Jesus. Jesus Christ, the, the same guy that rode into a donkey, rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, the same guy that cleared out the temple, the same guy that told that fig tree that it was a waste because it wasn't bearing fruit. Jesus Christ was crucified a week later. You don't think he knew this was all the time that he had? There was no other way that this story could go. This story couldn't go by Jesus saying, you know, next time I'd really like to see some fruit on you. Folks, there wasn't going to be a next time. This was it. And so look, if you call yourself a Christian and you're all pretty on the outside, but underneath, there is no fruit. Look, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You're a waste. That's what Jesus is saying in this verse. Jesus is telling us that if we aren't bearing fruit, we deserve to die. Folks, we need to be bearing fruit so that if someone that is hungry walks by us, we can give them what they need. So Jesus teaches us this lesson, and then a week later, he died the death that you and I deserve so that we could receive a gift that you and I cannot earn. He's telling us, fig tree, quit faking it. I created everything. I know what you're doing when no one else is looking. I knew what you were going to do 2,000 years ago, and I still died for you. Quit trying to be impressive. He knew 2,000 years ago that we were going to do all of the messiness and nastiness, crummy, grimy, slimy things that we do. And he still died for us. Wrestle with that for a moment. Are 
Are you hiding a sin right now? Look, I, I said this in December. I think it's worth repeating. Do you ever wonder why it is that your spouse is always the last one to buy into your awesomeness? Because they know you. They can see under your leaves and it can be pretty ugly. Look, the, the beautiful thing is, whatever the sin, the cross has a cover. Drugs and alcohol, covered. Anger and abuse, covered. Lust and pornography, it's covered. All of it is paid for. There isn't one thing that you have done or one thing that you can do that the cross of Christ doesn't cover. If you're a follower of Christ, all you have to do is confess and repent. Acknowledge it and run from it. I'd like to have you just bow your head. Close your eyes. Don't put anything away. Just close your eyes. We're going to sing a song here in a few moments. And as we prepare ourselves for that, I just want you to examine yourself. For the next few minutes, don't think about who's not here, who could have really benefited from this message. Just think about and pray for yourself. What are you hiding? What's underneath that you don't want people to see? And look, if, if you're good, maybe this topic doesn't relate to you, you know, obviously praise God for that. Just join me in praying for those that, that do struggle with this. Pray for those that have been hiding something. Join me in prayer that maybe they can break down that impressive facade and just let the light of Christ shine in their lives. Maybe you're a Christian here today and there's some sin that you just can't seem to shake. Maybe, maybe you claim Christianity, but underneath is some ugliness that you would like to be released from. Listen, quit trying to be impressive and ask for help. James 5, verse 16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Folks, sitting in your chair and confessing to the Lord is a great first step. Allowing someone else into that struggle so they can pray for you and, and hold you accountable, that's a special step. Maybe you're here today and, and you haven't yet made that commitment to, to follow Christ. Listen to me, you must know that He brought you here today for a reason. He, he wanted you to hear this message of the, of the fig leaves. It's three verses that are so easily, easy to just breeze right through. Maybe He's been pulling those lessons leaves back and exposing your faults and failures for a while now, but you just keep grabbing at more fig, fig leaves. Look, if you're ready to stop pretending, if you're ready to follow Jesus, we'd love to pray with you. We'd love to encourage you. Look, Jesus is calling you right now. His arms are open wide. You must know that forgiveness has been bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. If you would like us to pray with you, we'd love to have you come.